There's my volume on OBS. No, not bad. One, two, three, four. That seems like it's loud enough. recording and then I'm going to start start the lecture any second now um, everything's streaming I've got a few people watching me online thank you so much for joining me live this morning Good morning, folks. Thanks for joining me live here on this lovely, cold Thursday morning here in Canberra. Um, folks, we've got another, another fun day today. I've got another few things to show you with our little synthesizer setup. Um, still got that in here for this week, just making sure I've got a good view of it. Oh no, I need to get my camera in the right, the right angle, really. Oh, this little little um, tripod is not getting in deeply enough. Oh, come on. Whoops. Okay, we can see the synthesizer. That's a bit unstable, but I think we'll, um, we'll manage for today. Put that away for now and go back to RHS small. Should be able to make some sound when necessary today. Okay, turn that down. That's a weird preset. Um, my daughter is 18 months old and she really likes this synthesizer, so sometimes she changes things. <laughs> she doesn't know what she's doing though, sadly. If only she was making works of genius. This week was Networks Week, and it still is Networks Week. I hope everyone has been having an, an exciting time in their labs, coming to grips with interrupts, coming to grips with creating interactive programs, showing off your design proposals for the Tamagotchis. Um, we've had the Tamagotchis visiting the labs this week, which has been really fun to see what people want to do with them. I'll just remind you our um, <coughs> a few admin time items. I've posted on Piazza about little wires. Next week in the labs um, you'll be doing some network connections with little wires which we have provided for you. A large box of little wires arrived for me uh, to, to hand out for this week in, um, in labs. Um, these aren't required for an assignment or anything, it's just for the lab. So. Um, of course, if you really want to take one home to play with a little wire of your very own, you can take it. Otherwise, we can uh, keep them here with us for a future Comp2300 exciting um, activity. The, um, you might have start have an inkling of what you might be doing in your lab next week. Excuse me. Uh, what you might be doing in your lab next week. You'll be doing a lot of what we've been doing in the, the lectures, which is creating a way to transmit bytes from your micro bits output. But you'll be also working on the receiving end. So we haven't done the receiving end in, uh, our, in our lecture this week, and we're not going to. That's going to be an exciting task for you to figure out in, in the labs using little wires. So we've started to get that lab uh, content organized. I'll just get that get that up. We had to rewrite the lab because the, uh, that's a lecture, not a lab. We had to rewrite this from scratch because it was written for the board we used last year, which had different, different things you could do with it. So it, it made more sense to try a different lab. Um, so essentially you'll start with just connecting a micro bit to itself. In the lab, you'll be connecting micro bits to um, connecting to a tutor's micro bit to try sending some data 
and then you'll also connect to your own micro bit to send and receive data. So this lab will be completely possible for folks who are remote as well, but you won't be able to check it on a tutor's micro bit unless you send them the code. I guess we could try it that way. Um, but there's definitely, it's gonna be fun and exciting. So I hope you're up for something fun and exciting next week. A little bit tricky though. Thankfully, thankfully you don't have to do an assignment on it. So you can just exist in this world of, oh, this is quite hard. I'm, I might not need to use it, but I'm excited about learning anyway, uh, rather than feeling stressed that you have to learn something now and apply it in an assignment. You will have to probably answer an exam question about it though, although I haven't written that. Admin time. Um, assignment 2 pre-submissions are underway. Thank you for everyone for doing that. It's um, Hopefully you're getting good feedback and having good discussions. You've got mid-sem feedback coming your way early next week. Um, a few little things going on with that. There are some folks still doing deferred assessments and I just need to get that all wrapped up before we release those results. Quiz two opens next week. You've got another quiz. So make some time next week to attempt that. Um, and again, the same, same procedure. You can take this many times. Um, hopefully you get uh, you know, the highest mark possible. And it's really about, not about getting a high mark, but about learning, seeing where your understanding of, of different concepts is a bit shaky. That will be covering stuff you've already covered in the mid-semester exam and last semester, but probably the more, the more high-end parts of it as a start. And the second thing it will be covering is the topics we've done up to now, which is um, data structures, interrupts, and a uh, synchronization and networks. So a few extra topics uh, to cover. Where are we at? Where did we get up to last week? We talked about this kind of serial, asynchronous serial communication between two devices. We gave a, had a fun demo doing this with a micro bit. We talked about the difference between synchronous and asynchronous. So with synchronous serial, you have an extra clock line. We're going to talk about that to, today as well. Asynchronous serial, we had to have a timer on the input and a timer on the receiver. Um, the, the really, um, I guess, interesting part about this is that with asynchronous serial, you didn't need that extra wire. It doesn't seem like such a big deal until you're on a micro bit where you don't have many things to plug into. So there's a real limitation that means it's good to be able to do um, asynchronous serial. For synchronous serial, where you have a clock line, things actually turn out to be a bit easier. I will talk a bit about that later, later today. But first, I just want to return to the code I was writing last week. So if you remember, to get this byte to be sent on the wire, I had to do a number of things. I had to set up SysTick to be a um, kind of a general clock to let me know when to send a bit, put a bit on the wire. I had to have a function that would store a, the byte to send somewhere special and then go through bit by bit through that bit. And then I had to have a function that was going to make sure that these things or that or I had a global variable sorry that would let SysTick know is there a bit that I have to be sending and to be honest I was quite proud of my little implementation here I think that this was quite neat and simple um, it's there's ways of making this more complicated for no reason but everything seemed to work out first time which was pretty good but you, there was a lot of stuff there. So the point I want to make to, to start with this lecture, I guess, is is there some way of abstracting away some of this stuff so we don't have to worry about it? And I'll just get to get to where I want to. This was our um, the record of our demo last week. Did this MIDI sending, because I then had to send, like, have some other function that was going to send a byte at a time, and then multiple bytes together is really a whole message. And my question is, is there some way to consider like a layer way of doing this? So maybe there's some stuff that just deals with 
the GPIO levels being low and high. That's one very low abstraction level. And then a middle abstraction level that deals with assembling the byte that has to be sent at one time. And then another is higher level than that, which is saying, okay, please connect to another device and be ready for sending bytes. And then another layer, which is, you know, just saying, oh, connect to a MIDI device, send the note 60. Um, so that assembles the message of three bytes. And then a layer above that where there's just a button, I press that and it plays a note on my synthesizer. So there might be some way to sort out these different levels of network communication and separate concerns so that it's more easy to understand. And the cool thing then would be that you could reuse the, the lower level stuff for many applications and, and every part would be reused on a, on a sort of smaller uh, scale. So you get a kind of pyramid where the stuff at the bottom is used by everybody um, for any kind of communication. It's highly scrutinized, very well designed, super fast, and no one touches it unless you really have to. And then the stuff at the top is your, your particular application and you don't mess with the stuff which is really important. And as it turns out, I'm not the first person to ever think of this idea. Who would have thought that? The idea of sorting concerns into layers is quite a common one in computing. And so we have this thing called the seven layer open systems interconnection model. Um, and it's, it's a mouthful really. And this is from 1977. So not only am I not the first person to ever think of this idea, but people have been thinking of this idea for the last 45 years. And this was, the point of this model is to think in exactly this way. What if we had some concerns with connections between computers that are so widely used, we'd never worry about them. Someone else has made them. They're built into the hardware or completely covered, but they're standardized. So everyone knows how they use. And then on the other end, we have our individual application, which is not standardized. Um, but it gets the benefit of using every other standard connection. So when you're connecting two computers, you don't have to reinvent a way of sending a message on a wire, right? Because we've got absolutely widely used standards. Now, the thing with the seven layer OSI model, which is perhaps a bit frustrating, is that it's really cool and interesting and helps us understand how the layers in a, a connection between computers might work but it's not actually ever implemented. <laughs> Bits of it are implemented and the ideas are very influential, but it's, it's um, the whole thing as itself is not been, in some cases it has, but it's not very often completely used in practice. So here it is, the seven OSI network layers. You can print this out and put it on your pillow uh, and then you'll, absorb the seven layers in, in when you're sleeping. This is the kind of thing on the internet where there are like a million and one websites and people are desperate to tell you about the OSI network layers. Um, they'll tell you the what and the what and the how, but not the why, which is one of the, the tricky things about learning, uh, learning concepts from, from websites. Why do we have these things? Because it's hard when, when programmers have to implement everything from their software, application software, all the way down to GPIO signals. No one wants to do that. It's a mad thing to do. I did it madly last week, it was crazy. And um, in practice, it's a way of having all kinds of errors and issues and poor software. So here's the network layers. Down the bottom, we've got the physical layer. That's the actual wires, right? Then the next layer, the data link layer, that's um, being able to send bytes between these wires. Then the network layer, layer. So that's where we start to talk about computers talking to computers which talk to other computers. So doing packet routing. Then the transport layer. Now we're finally in some sense within the application space. Everything, oops, where's my pencil gone? Everything below here, this stuff could be like all in hardware, really. Hardware. I should put the hardware down here. The hardware's down here. 
hardware like routers and, and Wi-Fi connection boxes, all of these things, they, they have little computers in them, but they, they need to be appliances, not computers. And then up here we've got our software, and in fact, our application is really just at the top. Our app. And this stuff might be part of the OS. OS and libraries. So the, the transport would be organizing a connection, organizing, sending packets across a network to another computer. Session would be organizing a connection between one computer and another computer for a particular task within an application. Presentation, as that one always confuses me and hopefully I remember what it is in a minute. Um, and then the application is finally uh, like the actual API for sending a MIDI packet across a network. And then finally at the top, your data you actually want to send. And user means the programmer here. That's the programmer, not, not a end user. That's a really bad way of writing the word programmer. Anyway, let's go through these one by one, right down the bottom. Oh, yeah, physical layout, right down the bottom. <sighs> Transmission of a raw bit stream over a communication channel. So that's, there was a lot of stuff I was doing in the physical layer um, on my micro bit last, last time we were talking because I had to know about GPIO, I had to know about high levels and low levels, I had to know what the, the memory address of that GPIO port was and how to make an output, uh, output configuration, uh, not input. So all of that stuff is, is in the physical layer. It's actually touching the wire hardware. Um, I have to know that I have to have a resistor in between my, my GPIO port and the MIDI port so that it works correctly, all these little things. So the standards here, things like Ethernet cables, detectors, and amplifiers, the, the actual physical bits of hardware um, are part of the physical layer. Conversion of bits into electrical or optical signals. It's just really just the turning the GPIO on, on and off for me in the previous one. Data link layer. Reliable transfer of frames over a link. What's a frame? Well, I'll tell you, last week, last time we learned what a frame was in asynchronous serial, didn't we? We start the start bit, that's where you have a, a falling edge. Then you've got your frame of, of bits. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And you've got a, you got your eight bits there. Start. And then you've got your stop bit at the end. Stop. That's one frame. Now there's a few things last week that I didn't tell you about because we didn't need them for MIDI. But there can also be an extra bit here. And the extra bit is called the parity bit. Boop, 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 there's a parity bit. And what's this? This number is going to be 1010. One o one o, one two three four. So our parity bit, there's, a, there's our stop bit. Stop. Our parity bit is going to be determined by counting the number of ones in the byte we're sending. In this case, it's four ones, and then we see four. Well, that's an even number. And so we make our parity bit either zero or one, depending on our choice. So in my case, I'm gonna say that it should be zero. It's, there's two options, right? You can either have it zero if it's even or one if it's even. There's actually, it's a configuration option, right? There's different, different ways of doing it. It makes no difference, it does the same thing. What's the point of doing this thing, a parity bit? What's the point? It means that if you accidentally on your during your transmission, for some weird reason, lightning strikes and one of these bits is wiped out, the receiving computer will say, okay, I've got three bits, but wait a minute, my parity bit is zero. Three is odd. Three bits set in the, in the sequence. Three is odd, but my parity bit is zero, indicating that the bit should be even. So I can take my frame 
and throw it away and ask for a new one or something, right? Some, at least I can say error has occurred. Someone notice me, maybe send an interrupt, right? I don't know. The, it's up to the, something else. Some other part of the system can deal with that, but um, at least we can know about whether there's an error because of some electrical problem with the wire. So that takes care of error correction. There's other ways of doing this. I've just, that's the simplest method. And that's the way the parity bit concept in parity bit is part of UART. Um, someone's made a very good question, which is, what if two bits are struck by lightning, then you're completely screwed. That's, that's the answer. Um, <laughs> you would, you are only, only can survive one bit being struck by lightning. Hopefully if two bits are struck by lightning, four bits are struck by lightning. <laughs> um, yes. <laughs> you know the way with, with redundancy and error checks, they can only survive so much, right? Um, and, and different systems, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not the expert in, in error correction. I know there's a lot of folks in CS who are really into that stuff. Um, but your, when you've got this um, redundant information being stored that lets you check against errors, it can only survive a certain amount of error correction of errors and then it doesn't work anymore. So if you've got, you know, there's this idea if you have multiple hard drives in an array and you can have one hard drive is redundant because it's giving you some um, check on the other two. And if one of your, any one of your hard drives fails, you'll survive. But if two fail, then you lost all your data. So there's, we just sort of make a bet that it's better. It's very unlikely for a hard drive to fail. And if in the unlikely event that it does fail, it's, it's extremely unlikely that two fail. So it's, it's unlikely that one bit is transmitted incorrectly. I mean, it's a wire. We would have to have like lightning or something bad happening. It's extremely unlikely that you would have two bits fail. I guess if you had a very long wire, there's more chance of things going wrong. Um, and things do go wrong, right? I mean, things go wrong. I've gone on a digression here. I'm luckily, I'm doing this, this lecture from my house. I know that if it's a windy, stormy afternoon, I can have trouble with lectures because the wire outside my window, the telephone wire from my house to the telephone pole flaps around in the wind. And if it does that, my router loses the connection <laughs> because there's some, it just can't handle that amount of error correction. Physically moving the wire introduces um, problems with it. It's a very, I'm sure it's a very old copper wire. Um, it has some issues anyway and stormy conditions, wind flapping the wires around tends to ruin my, my internet and my house. Weird, but I think it's true. That seems to be what happens. Okay, flow control is another one. We haven't talked about that, but it's, it's supported. The idea of flow control is that, like imagine that you've got a fire hose and you're trying to send water across to a friend and you don't want to, your friend is trying to collect the water in buckets. So the person with the hose has to turn it on just a little bit to fill up the bucket. And then when the bucket is full, the person at the other end needs to be like, turn it off, turn it off, turn it off. So they can switch to a new bucket, right? So they need to be, be filling up that data with the hose, fill the bucket up. And then they move that aside, get a new bucket, fill that one up. So the, there's some, some extra bit of communication to say, stop sending things, stop sending things, stop sending things. I've got to change to a new bucket or something like that. So you can have some extra connections with in UART, which allow you to automatically or some kind of extra communication between the two parties to say, stop sending me frames right now. I just need to, I need to get some new cache space or something. I need my, my application layer needs to start sucking away things out of my cache because I can't take any more uh, reception. So anyway, reliable transfer of frames over a link. This is UART has all of these cap capacities. We have flow control. It's possible with UART. We have parity bits for error correction and we have some um, synchronization, which is the start and the stop bits 
that say when a frame is starting and stopping. That's the sync and sync. Why do we need these, by the way? Well, um, because we've got two timers, a timer at one end and a timer at the other end, we have to make sure the timers are synchronized. So the start bit is basically saying to the receiver, start your stopwatch now and start clocking in these bit bits at the, the pre-agreed rate. But maybe the stopwatches are not exactly the same. And maybe one of them is like a little bit faster or a little bit slower. So they'll be in sync for a while, but after a while they'll go out of sync if they're slightly different rates. You can never get everything exactly the same. It can be highly accurate, but still a little bit out. So the idea of the, um, of the start bit and the stop bit is that we only synchronize our watches for eight bits. And we think we can keep them in sync for that amount of time. That's a very short amount of time. So it's a very good bet. And then every time we do a stop bit and a new start bit, we're starting the stopwatches again so that we're always together. <sighs> layer three, network layer. I've said enough about data link because data link was the one we have fun with, right? <laughs> so that's where we're really spending some time in COM2300. Network layer. This is where we do stuff which we don't do in, in COMP2300, but you might do if you go and take uh, the networks course that we have at the ANU. So the point of the network layer is to transfer packets inside the network. So we've got our data link layer sending, sending frames of data reliably from, um, that's a B for a byte, another B for a byte, another B for a byte, to from one computer to another. And then we've got a third computer, and this computer needs to somehow decide to send that data this way, rather than sending it up to computer X over here. So it wants to send it to Y and not X. So we talked about packet switching um, last time, which is a way of, it's the, the general idea of adding addressing data inside a packet, addressed packet. So it's like putting the, the label on an envelope to send it to um, a certain person. Then you send, the, send your parcel to the post office and then the post office reads the label and says, okay, I need to send that to person Y, not person X. So we have a very common one that we use all the time, IP, internet protocol, is the, the, the normal standard networking um, system we use that allows us to put addresses on packets and send them and make sure that they get to the correct place. This is the kind of thing you'll learn a lot more about if you take networks. And you'll fill in all of the, the gaps because everyone has a, a lot of people have a lot of sort of casual knowledge about networking, but, and that's probably where I am, but not so much specific knowledge about how it works, which is important to know as well. Is network layer something you need to think about in COMP2300 if you have multiple connections? I don't think you ever need to think about network layer unless you have a network. <laughs> so at the moment you've, we've got, if you're just sending one, one message to one other host, you don't need network layer. If you've got a micro bit with GPIO wires 010 and 1, going there and two and three, you're still not doing packet switching. So you don't need to have a network layer. But if you did have multiple micro bits, supposing you're connecting by a wireless connection, you've inventing everything from scratch and you want to be able to send, um, have a mesh network and send a, a packet from one location, find its way through this network to another, you're gonna to have to have some routing and addressing. So that would be network layer. Transport layer. Okay, so here is where we've got packets sent. What's the next thing? We have like agreements between people on the network to send a number of packets. So the, the next abstraction above one packet is multiple packets. And we haven't talked about this at all because we've really just been obsessed with um, one, a, num a couple of frames, a very small number of frames. So if we look at MIDI, we had OX, 
nine zero, that was note on. And that was one frame. But that's not, not going to be a whole MIDI message. As we I told you last week, we need to have uh, three bytes together. Uh, 7F, not FF. You idiot, Charles. Okay, that's one MIDI packet. But what about a whole song? <laughs> well, it's going to be a lot of MIDI packets. C, C, G, G, A, A, B. A, A, G, sorry. Do, do, so, so, la, la, so. That's the first five notes, of six, seven notes of Twinkle Twinkle. So, to have some kind of song connection between a micro bit and something else, we need to be able to establish that our song is starting now, we make a connection with the synthesizer, and we send this sequence of packets giving it that song information. So this is above, above the frame level, there's one frame inside there, there's the, the bit level, that's, we can think of this with the amount of data. Bit is physical, frame is data link, MIDI packet is network, song is transport. <laughs> Yes, transport of data between hosts. And this is where, if we go back to the network diagram, I'm going to talk about established connection in a minute. Someone's just asked to clarify about this. If we've got a, a network diagram here, this is you only relevant in a network capacity. So the MIDI sending example is a bit, a bit um, misleading because we are directly connecting between two devices on my desk. Within a network, that's a computer, this is A, this is B, C, D, E, F. So supposing we want to send data, song data, from computer A to computer F. Well, we've got to actually make a number of physical connections, don't we? We have to send data to B, B has to send data to D, then D has to decide which way is faster, sending data to E, and then F, that's faster. Alternatively, we could go this way, and perhaps if lightning struck here and that burned down, we might go C to E. But from the point of view of the transport layer, A is just going to be sort of saying, I want to connect to F. And then F is over the other side saying, Hi, A, I can hear you now. And all of the packets being sent through this network are happening magically. They don't, they don't need to see it because they can only see the transport layer. All of the stuff below them is may as well be magic, they don't need to worry about it. So A is just shouting packets onto the wire, just addressed to F, and F is saying, um, I'm listening. Now similarly to the sending frames, A sending to F has to establish a kind of connection. So um, A is going to say, F, I'm going to start sending you packets now. By the way, this is the start of a song, and it's not going to end until I say it, it is ending. And then A starts sending you know, the packets on the, on the wire, C, C, G, G, A, A, G, and then end. So again, we've got a sort of copy of some of the lower level concepts, but in a higher level context. So we've got to connect from A to F, establish a connection, agree on the, on the parameters of what the protocol is, but this is at the packet layer, not bits, um, rather than sending uh, ones and zeros, we're sending whole MIDI notes, which might be a number of bytes, or might be sending huge amounts of data, or parts of a picture or something, right? And so the connections can be established, managed, terminated. We've got another sort of higher level kind of flow control, and also higher level error detection. So at this stage, we know that we've got our low level protection against small one bit off errors, but we're sending packets across a number of different places now. They might be going all the way around the world, under the, under the ocean, through the air, up into space and back, if you're on a satellite connection, right? There could be all kinds of ways of errors being introduced. So we have more error detection involved, and TCP is our 
classic um, transport control protocol. That's the one which we use for all of our regular internet connections that involves error, co error correction and it's very robust. We very rarely open a website and find all the images garbled, right? <laughs> because it works so well. <laughs> People really thought about this. It's amazingly good how well it works when you think about how many computers and crazy connections all of this data goes through. Another very simple, um, a simpler protocol that you might have heard of is called UDP, Universal Datagram Protocol. So <clears throat> if you often make a, um, you probably haven't done this in, in programming yet, but if you want to send messages simply between two things on a network, in, perhaps in your own house or, or between two devices, you might create a UDP socket in your programming language of choice. And this kind of thing, the UDP socket would be a framework provided by your operating system which would know how to set up a UDP connection to another host through a network, and it will know how to send data to that, that host. The good thing about UDP is that it's very fast, and you don't have to do a lot of work to set it up. The bad thing is that it doesn't have any, any error correction, and if, an, if a message is lost, you don't know about it. <laughs> so it just, things just disappear. So sometimes UDP can be a problem you know, over a wireless connection where there's much more chance of dropping a packet. So if you make UDP connections with Wi-Fi over Wi-Fi, totally possible, um, your computer will let you do it, but you might just not receive messages sometimes. Um, and I've had that happen to me in a, I was doing a musical performance where we had a lot of UDP connections and I was doing something over Wi-Fi and I didn't think about this. This was a long time ago before I was thinking about such things at a high level. and. I realized in the performance that the messages weren't getting through and something was broken and it was bad. So that was, I learned my lesson about UDP and Wi-Fi that day. I'll never forget it. Um, TCP is the, the typical one we use for regular internet traffic. And it does have this error correction. It's just a bit more fussy and uh, sometimes not so good for very, very um, low latency connections, I would say. Yep, uh, transport. Anyway, someone's, no more questions about that, so maybe I've talked long enough about transport. Session layer. So it's a bit confusing about why we would have differences between session and transport. And part of the confusion is, as you'll see in a minute, our normal way of doing things doesn't have very good separation between these layers. Um, but we, it's just a slightly higher level idea about connection. It's similarly about having a connection, but this time there are two applications. And this time I'm now going to say one of the applications is a keyboard, right? And the other one is a synthesizer, which is I'm going to represent by a speaker. And then there's a like in magic network connection happening between them, right? This could go through all kinds of places. We don't know where it's going. It goes around the world and back and then it somehow arrives. But from our perspective, our perspective, it's just a straight line all the way through because our network, transport network, data link and physical layers are all working perfectly. So maybe this is where it's going to say, I would like to have a song please and it's going to have an ending point. So that's more like a session um, because it's something just related to one application. Whereas the, the transport layer might be related to all of the applications within a computer. Not so easy to describe that one because we don't tend to use it that much. Another one which is a bit difficult to describe because we don't use it that much is the presentation layer. But the idea here is that you've got your, your straight line through, but you might like to have some kind of translation of the data in place. So the, the data presents in a slightly different way than it appears on the, on the wire. So on the wire, it might be all question mask, marks and here it's all exclamation marks, right? We're doing some kind of encoding and decoding 
maybe for encryption purposes, maybe to represent special things which we don't have the characters to represent, changing one sort of character into another, maybe a virtual kind of encoding scheme for some kind of weird representation. It's difficult to find very good examples because this kind of stuff tends to be handled by the application, but in within OSI, the OSI framework, there's a specific layer for that kind of thing to happen. Encoded. And then finally, at the top, the application layer. So your application is going to have its own APIs um, or interface to, to do things which might be like create a mail message and send it or create a MIDI message and send it to, to someone on a network. And it will all be very easy and nice for a programmer to create applications that use network connections because all of the other layers are handled for them. The, the programmer doesn't have to deal with encryption, doesn't have to deal with sessions or transport, all that stuff is all, all figured out. And we only have to say, create a mail over here and receive mail. and to who, to someone, and from someone. And the, the whatever systems we've got underneath us, the operating system, the computer hardware, the routers and infrastructure of our network, all of that will be working perfectly and we can just have a very nice, safe environment where we can trust that everything's gonna work without too much hassle. That's the idea of the application layer. So. All the seven layers. It's a mouthful, isn't it? But, and it's, it seems confusing, but it's an important concept because of this idea of understanding that to do something complicated like network connections that requires collaboration between multiple different computers, we need to have lots of standards in place for that to work. And because we have, need to have these standards, it's good to stratify something to work out which bit of the network is responsible for which other bit. So for instance, you could say that if you were going to create some hardware to live on a network, a router for instance, you're really only using these bottom layers. You don't have to, your router shouldn't be worrying about transport, session, presentation, or applications. Your router doesn't care whether it's mail messages being sent or MIDI messages or, or uh, websites. Your router only it receives packets and looks at what the address is and sends it to the right person. And that's the, the concept. Okay. So here's the problem with OSI. Here's the problem with OSI is that almost all internet connections that you will ever make will be using this system, which we use for the internet called the combination of two protocols, TCP, transport control protocol and IP internet protocol. And the reason that this is problematic is that TCP doesn't fit ideally within OSI, <laughs> TCP IP. The physical layer, that's just fine. We got that, that's all similar. Then TCP IP has a kind of another layer called network, which will sit above physical, deal with those data frame stuff, but also it has a bit of some more of the packet stuff involved in it. So it's, it's kind of cutting across both data link and the bottom part of network. Then there's the internet protocol layer, which is the other, another part of the network layer in OSI. Then we've got our transport layer, which this is the, the TCP bit. That matches the transport layer in OSI. So, so far so good, but it also has a bit of session responsibilities. So, that's not quite, not quite working. And then session presentation and application, well, that's just all application from TCP IP, which is why it's hard to sometimes express why session presentation and application makes sense. Because in your everyday programming experience, which you'll ever have, which will most likely be with TCP IP, at least particularly while you're at uni and dealing with courses like the networks course, your, your application responsibilities will cover all of this stuff. So <clears throat> kind of a bummer for OSI. It, it didn't become like the, the most used standard. The most used standard is TCP IP. 
but it was still highly influential and everyone learns about it in their in their CS degree. So it's important to just keep it in mind. There are network stacks which did use OSI precisely. One example, which I've, I've deleted the slide actually, because it's there's not much point except to say this, which was it was called Apple Talk, and it was a particular networking stack for Apple computers in the 90s, early 90s and 80s. And like since the when the internet came on the scene and people wanted to connect all of their computers together and have home networks, all of those special like particular network stacks for particular operating systems, that stuff disappears, right? Everyone just uses TCP IP because we want to connect to the internet. That's what we want to do. It's not just about three computers in a network in an office or, or five to 10 computers on Apple Talk. It's about connecting your computer to everybody else's one on the internet. <clears throat> okay, what about synchronous? Did we miss that? <laughs> and what else is on the micro bit? So a few more slides about just filling in a few details um, from today. So I'm going to talk about another interface. So far we talked about UART. That was an, a first serial interface. And UART was Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transceiver Protocol. Async, which meant no clock connection. SPI is a very good example of a serial interface which does have a clock connection. It's synchronous. Which is cool because you don't need timers to make it work. <laughs> well, you need a timer on one end, but um, the receiver doesn't have to have a timer. The receiver can just listen and just do what it's told. I'll show you what, what, how that works in a minute. SPI is used by gazillions of devices within inside devices. In particular, stuff like SD cards. Well, SD cards have a SPI mode. Um, they also have other modes which are a bit more... Uh, The SPI mode is a bit slower, I think, than the, the other ways of communicating with a, an SD card, but SPI, lots of stuff inside a computer, like talking to different specific parts of a, a, um, a circuit board with a lot of devices on it might use SPI in between them. There's a good question here, which I'll get to in a minute, but it's not related to SPI. Um, just a, a note here, if you've looked at SPI before, I'm using the new terminology. We use more inclusive language for, for electronics um, recently, so the slides might not make sense if you've learned the previous way, but hopefully it makes sense when I read it out. Here's what SPI looks like. It's a four-wire connection. So we've got, <clears throat> basically on each device, we've got an input, an output, a clock, and a selection line. So the input line, of course, is going to receive data, serial data. The sending output line is going to transmit data. The clock is going to keep everything synced up. And the peripheral selector is going to be useful when we, if we have multiple devices on the same um, set of connections. So SDI here is serial data in. Oops. SDO is serial data out, SCK is serial clock, and CS is chip select. So in this little diagram, I've illustrated here that this is going to be happening in hardware because we've got, in fact, a shift register, which is a piece of hardware that can take, might have an input and a clock, and maybe eight outputs, and that's only seven. <clears throat> and if you clock in 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, and the clock's going whoop, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. First, after the first step, the zero comes in, it ends up here. Then the zero moves down the line, right, until it's sort of all shifted along by one character until after all of those bits are clocked in, we've got our our message 
in parallel. So you might use a shift register inside a computer to translate something happening on a serial line into a parallel format. So then it can be sort of read directly from a register, memory mapped register by you in your computer in some way. Uh, and so that kind of hardware will be used to create a serial sending and receiving system that doesn't have to rely on a timer to get it to work, right? It can, it can work just with this clockwork non-software hardware um, thing. Shift registers, like, they, they're not imaginary, right? You can buy one. You can go to JCAR and buy a shift register as a little chip. It's like a little bug, right? And use it in, in a project. But they're also built into a CPU as a kind of built-in component. Yeah, so in this case, the controller here is generating the clock. They're generating the clock. And the peripheral is just receiving the clock. So the clock input is being used to drive the transmitting on the peripheral. So there's a shift register being clocked to receive data and another one working backwards being clocked to send data. And the chip select line is saying, I'm talking to you, so <laughs> this peripheral, please do the work. Let's have a look at what the messages look like, data and timing. So the idea with SPI is that your clock is going up and down, up and down. And whenever there's a rising change on the clock, that's the, the instruction for both sides to simultaneously set their outputs. So because we've got SD serial data input and output, the two sides can actually talk simultaneously. It works in duplex. So the output person, this one can set their level, whether it's high or low for that bit. The other one can set high or low as well on the rising edge. Then on the falling edge, both parties, the controller and the peripheral, read off their inputs. <laughs> so whether it's high or low, they read it in. And then the next rising edge, they, they set their outputs. Next falling edge, they read their inputs. And in this way, you can see how the clock is kind of controlling the read-write. There's this line called chip select, which is falls at the start of transmission and rises at the end. So this is just saying that the peripheral needs to be actively listening and, and working with the data that's coming in, responding to these clock changes. If the chip select was high, the peripheral wouldn't have to do anything. It doesn't have to um, make any changes at all. <clears throat> So what can you do with these SPI synchronous connections? Well, you can read and write from SD cards, which is cool. If you want to, you could connect an SD card with little clip wires to your micro bit and get it to work, read data and write data. Totally possible. Another thing you might want to do is read write with peripherals. So there's a thing, another protocol called IS2C or I2C, Inter-Integrated Circuit Protocol. It's a slightly, um, whoops, a slightly simpler version of <coughs> SPI that only has clock and a half duplex input or output. So why would you use that? Well, we'll talk about it in a second. I'll just get through a few more slides and then we'll have a look at the manual for your micro bit. What about some typical things? We're just, we're going back down to the low level stuff. Um, these are just a few framing slides really, but your regular blue wire that you connect your computer to your router, that's called an ethernet connector. And it's a, that wire has been used for a number of different protocols actually that we, we have, we all call collectively ethernet. There's different versions of ethernet that, that support different speeds. So you used to do this at very a pretty slow speed of 10 megabits per second with thick coax cables. And then people started to use those, what we now look at as those twisted pair blue cables. 
and now the, the quality of those cables got better. So typically people have one gigabit per second normal copper cable ports, but there are standards up to really fast one gigabit at 100 gigabits per second. So this is most local area networks are on ethernet as our, our um, physical layer. One cool thing is that old ethernet and there's a video here you can watch yourself old ethernet connections used a slightly different kind of encoding for sending messages called a Manchester encoding. Yeah, 100 gigabits per second. That's like super duper fast ethernet. I've forgotten what, what that's called. Ethernet. Uh, varieties. Oh, 400 gigabits per second. Wow. I didn't know that was possible. Most of us just have like our 1000 base T connection. And within our houses, we're like, okay, it's great if we actually get one gigabit per second. If you want to get faster than that, you tend to have to have very special cables. <laughs> um, and they're really thick and annoying to deal with. So most, most networks don't actually have those um, Cat7 connectors. Yeah, I don't know. You can learn about it your own, on your own time. Manchester encoding. I'm drawing over my head here. Manchester encoding. I just wanted to point this out as a different, I, different way of sending data where we're looking at the direction of a change. So a falling edge is a zero and a rising edge is a one. And this would be used in like in 10 base T, the older ethernet standards. So the signal goes up, that's a one. This only happens at the clock, right? So there's the next clock, signal goes up, signal goes down. One, two, yeah, up, down, down. So you can see if it wants to do two downs in a row, it's got to move the signal quickly in between the clock pulses back to the top. And if it wants to do up, down, it has to keep the signal at the top in between the clock pulse or at the bottom. So you can see a video of, of Ben Eater um, with a great YouTube channel investigating Ethernet connections online. <clears throat> Another, just to point out one more uh, network idea, which is Bluetooth LE. This is the wireless radio um, system, which is very, very common. You'd mostly be used to using it for like your mouse connecting to your computer or your watch connecting to your phone or your um, PlayStation controller connecting to your PlayStation. The, uh, it's really the only network connection which is supported by the, by the micro bit. The micro bit is designed or the, the chip used is designed to be used in Bluetooth devices. So you can have a look in the, in the NRF 2833 manual for more details there. Now, we talked a lot about OSI today. If you want to learn more about that, please read this textbook. <laughs> it's available online for free from the ANU library. It's also a funny kind of abstraction is that you can use, um, you know, programs are funny. These people su suggested it as a, a joke, I guess, a submission to the network working group for a new standard, which would um, encapsulate IP datagrams in avian carriers. So I don't know if you're aware of what an avian, avian carrier is, but that means a bird. So putting little messages onto a pigeon and letting the pigeon go. Um, very amusing. Someone just said, doesn't, doesn't the, the micro bit have radio? Well, yeah, but the, that radio is a, it's just the antenna, right? So the, the radio peripheral can support Bluetooth or a number of other standards. Um, yeah, so that's the radio uh, peripheral. Now, what is on the micro bit? Let's just open our micro bit manual. What's on the micro bit? Uh, 
So for this, I'm just going to have a look in the peripheral section to see what we've got. Peripherals. There's all this cool stuff. But I'll pick out a few ones to talk to you about. One of these ones is going to be radio. Here we are, 2.4 gigahertz radio. So this is the radio transceiver which is available on the micro bit. It can be used for a lot of different standards. The Bluetooth low energy, um, typical connections to other computers with that one. And then this other one, IEEE 802.15.4, 250 kilobits per second mode, and then two proprietary modes from the manufacturer called uh, that work at one megabit per second or two megabits per second. There's some information here apparently about how to deal, deal with this. It's not very, um, not very sufficient really to do much, but we can look at this block diagram and see that our, our, um, the hardware here is actually assembling the pa packets. Packet assembler, bit counter, CRC, a cyclic redundancy check, that's the, some error correction. Uh, whitening is, is just helping the transmission to be more understandable at the other end, um, making it more like white noise that tends to help somehow. I'm not a, not a telecommunications engineer, so I'm not sure why. And then our transmitter and then the antenna. So the hardware itself is taking care of assembling packets, counting bits, dealing with addresses and, and doing some of these other things. And in fact, most of the communications peripherals on the micro bit are designed not to be fed byte by byte information, but you're supposed to use them with DMA, which is called, that means direct memory access. So the, you just sort of tell it, okay, I'd like you to start in this bit of RAM, and then I'd like you to just send the next 256 bytes, right? And the, the hardware itself, without doing any more stuff in your program, it will go and read the memory um, while your program is doing other stuff. So that's a very useful technique, which we're not going to go into any more detail about in this course, but just to let you know it's there. So that's the radio. What else have we got? We've got an SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface Device. It's the same idea as, as I was illustrating on the slide, except there's hardware for it. We've got an I squared C device. Where is that? Under I? Oh no, we don't. If, it, if you want I squared C, I think you're probably supposed to use the SPI device. There's an I squared S device, which is particularly another version of this similar idea, except just for sound. Serial transceiver, same idea. And then if you want to make a, a regular MIDI connection, really you're not supposed to do it bit by bit as I've been doing it. Ah, oh, there is two wire interface. There's I squared C, it's called TWI. Two wire interface. So you'd use this if you want to talk to the motion sensor on your, um, on your micro bit, which is a separate chip. There's a temperature sensor, I didn't know that. Cool. Someone should use that in their um, in their project. Uh, where is the other one? UART. There we go. And we're going to just do do five minutes of UART. Universal asynchronous receiver transmitter. And just to to illustrate our point, this hardware supports the automatic flow control. It does the parity checking for you if you need that. It supports rate control. It can use DMA as well. You have a slightly different, there's a different section for the same hardware that make it work with DMA, but we're not gonna do that. And rather than having to send bits across GPIO, all you have to do is put a byte to be sent in a particular register and tell it to send it and it goes and deals with it. And then it will send you an interrupt when it's done. So. There, a lot of stuff is handled for you with the UART um, hardware. Um, I don't think I really have any more slides, so I'm just going to go back to this MIDI demo. 
and have a bit of fun with it. See if there are any more questions going on that I've missed so far. There's a question here, doesn't, uh, where the local wireless networks we normally use fit with this? LAN or AirDrop or Bluetooth? Um, I think, I don't know how AirDrop works, but I think that uses Bluetooth to establish a connection and then uses a um, point to point um, Wi-Fi. I'm not sure. LAN, like the idea of OSI is that you don't have to care, you don't have to care what is going on below this line. So that could be LAN, it could be Wi-Fi, it could be Bluetooth. Like your, your, your computer just figures out um, which connection is going to be used, but all of the, the details are hidden. And so with TCP IP, um, that's sort of all of this stuff, that's the LAN, um, BT, Wi-Fi. That's all this physical stuff we don't need to worry about. We just want to send bytes from one person to the other. Bytes to bytes. So we don't need to worry about different types of networks. The, the hardware handles that. I know it's not always, that's an idealist way of thinking about it. It doesn't always work that way, but um, that's the, the idea of that kind of abstraction anyway. Okay, where, what about my little demo? I'll put away my, turn off my little scribble pad, and we'll do five minutes of this. So last week, well last time, we spent the best part of an hour writing a system to send bits. And it worked well, but it was the best part of an, oops, it was the best part of an hour. And this week I want it to be, there's sending those, those, um, making my cool little song. Try and get some. There's my song from last week, turn that down. We're gonna do a similar thing, but we're gonna use the UART hardware. So, I've got my UART addresses here, and I've got my instructions, so let's do it. I've already got my, my GPIO setup ready, so I'm gonna just copy that in. This is from Monday, so if you've forgot how that works, you can revise it. Now the next thing I'm going to do is start setting some hardware up. So this is just very similar to how you would set up SysTick, how you'd set up GPIO. I'm going to load some stuff in. Um, Adra UART. Load in the, the UART address. I'll load in the UART config as well. Uh, offset UART config. Now I know from the manual that I need to do, I've read this in detail and I understand the order of events and what has to be set up. And I've looked into the, um, the registers. And I know for, for config, the config register is really about hardware flow control, parity, the number of stop bits, and the type of parity. And actually, I don't need any of that stuff. I don't need anything other than the default. I can just set this to zero and be happy with the, the config register. So I'll just mov r2 rx0 and then store r2 r0 r1. Someone asked me how long it took me to work out a new peripheral. I spent a couple of hours on the weekend figuring out the UART um, hardware. 
that's how long, a couple of hours. And I probably could have sent it more if I'd read the manual more, more uh, cleanly the first time, but I made a mistake and I'll tell you what the mistake was in a minute, which cost me a couple of hours of frustration. Um, the thing, the difference with, between me doing it and you doing it, or you I'm talking to all the students, is that I know what I'm looking for because I've had experience with this stuff over some years and you're looking at everything for the first time. The first time you do something, it's going to be the hardest time. So um, I've been looking at this manual, the NRF 8, um, 52833 manual since September last year when I started deciding to use the micro bit and I worked out how to set LEDs and I thought this will work. <laughs> And I, I got Ben, um, ben Gray to, to write the audio library to make sure that would work. And we decided to go ahead and buy a lot of micro bits for this year. And then recently I've been reading the manual more and learning about other peripherals. So the next thing we've got to do is set the, the baud rate. That's the speed. So we previously, on Monday, we did this with the... Um, did this by setting the timer to have a specific uh, loop looping speed, right? Or reset speed. But this time we can just set the UART to be a particular speed that we want. And so I'm just going to get this all ready because I need to look in the manual to set the baud rate. Where's that? And I want MIDI, right? Which, if you remember, was 31,250 bits per second. So I need to set this particular value into the baud rate memory map um, offset. I have to say that it's a lot easier to work with this, this chip than the one we used last year. The manual for the, the disco board was terrible, or just more painful than this one. I need to actually store it. I can't just sit, sit there. Two, uh, zero, uh, one. Okay, I've already remembered this, this R0, so I'm not, not loading that up again. Next, I need to set the transmit pin. So the UART hardware, this is pretty cool, it can actually send to any of the pins, any of the GPIO pins. We just have to tell it which one. So letter uh, one, offset UART uh, P cell TX. And then I need to get my special number, the, all of the config. This is very similar to the the button input. We need to set a bunch of stuff within one memory mapped register. And this is where I made my big mistake on the weekend. Very frustrating. I, bl I blame my baby if, if I ever make a mistake like this because she'll be like da 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 and I'm like trying to read the manual and can't get it right. So there you go. Ah, pins. So we've got three things to deal with in the pin select um, register. We have to say which pin we want, which port we want, and then a connection um, connection field. And the connection field is bit 31. And my mistake was that I assumed that if connection field was one, that would mean it's connected. I thought if setting it one would be connected. No, one is disconnected and zero is connected. Like Ah, why would they do that to me? I'm, I'm sure there's a good reason that the reset field for this has to be FFFFFFFF. But, like, I mean, someone in the, thank you in the chat for sympathizing with me. This just, don't read the manual carefully for these, particularly for these configuration registers, because that is just nasty. Uh, so what do I need? I need to send a zero to bit 31, that means connected. I need to send a zero to bit five, that means port zero, and I need to send a two, pin two, which is ring zero, the same pin I was using last time, to um, the lowest bits. So connected, port zero, pin two, and then store that. Cool. Now we're getting close. Enable, this is another one you have to read the manual for. We want to enable this peripheral. You have to do that after you've set the pin. So I have to read the manual to work that out. And the enable register 
You have to make sure you set a four in the enable register. You'd think it would be one, but it's not. You set a four in the enable register, which enables UART. I th think the reason for this is that there's the UART and the UART DMA version both use the same registers. So if you put a different number in there, it probably turns it into the DMA version somehow. Uh, letter R2, four, and we'll store R2, R0, R1. Okay, now our UART is enabled. It knows to talk to um, ring zero, and it knows um, the baud rate, and it's configured. That's ready. That wasn't too bad. It was only three, three things. So I've got two more things to do, which is to actually put a byte into its buffer, and then I tell it to, to start sending. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? Um, I'll get its buffer. Of S U R T T X D. That's the transmit buffer. And I'm just going to put, I don't know, put F F in there. That's actually a significant number for MIDI. It just means sort of don't do anything. Clear. It seems to do. Be not quite right. I guess that I could do this more carefully, but I just want to to get it started. So I can put a byte in the buffer and then I just need to start the task. Starting the task, at least you just set a one in the, in the um, UART start TX memory match register. Or R2, R0, R1. Now, once I've done this, having, having started the task, and set the buffer. I'm actually done. It will send this one byte. Now it sends. TXD is the transmit buffer. The byte to actually send. Now it can send this byte and I can check the TX ready register to find out when it's done. And then after that, I can send, keep, every time I update the value in the transmit buffer, that byte will get sent immediately. So it's going to send that first byte. Um, I'll just build this and hope it works. We'll see if we get that. Um, that thing on the screen. I've got my, my knob there. I'll send that to single. You should be able to see it. Turn on ring zero. Yep, so that's now we've got the, our, our um, GPIO at the high level. Set the config, that doesn't do anything. Set the baud rate, doesn't do anything. Set the transmit pin, hasn't done anything yet. Enable UART, hope it works. Put the byte FF into the buffer, and then we start the task. And it says hold. I might just start it again and just see if I can get that to pick it up. I sometimes have a little bit of trouble getting my my nice little demos to actually work if I'm just clicking through them. Okay, there's my 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 first byte. 
This one's pretty easy. It's just got a stop a start bit, which is zero. That this is the the everything getting ready high. Then there's my start bit, and then there's the f f f f f f, and then the stop bit, and then it stays high at the end. So so far so good. Um, now, how am I going to deal with this? What I really want to do is send a MIDI note. I might abstract this into some, some nice function. Function send note. That's going to take a note in in R zero. So I need to send um, and maybe push R zero. No, that's not going to work well. Uh, that's too complicated. <laughs> I will make another function called block until ready. Whoops. So I'm going to do the same thing I did before in this loop. blr090 to block, uh, to get that ready. Then I will put that into the txt. I'll change that to R2. Just to make sure I've got all my registers ready. Then the my uh, my note I'm going to play, which was R5 from Monday. Um, the question is, so you always have to start it with some initial byte to send. I believe so, because as soon as you trigger the start TX task, it's going to send that first byte. If I was smart, I would have some way to like have the first byte I'm sending be useful, but I'm not smart. I can't work out, can't quite get myself straight on a way to do it without having to have that slight, slightly weird first byte. Um, so now I'm sending the notes. This is sending the notes. And now I need to send the volume of R2, maximum volume, same thing. Now, the issue here is that my CPU is just going to run down this line, running these, sending these bytes before they've had the chance to stop. So I need to do something to pause until the UI is ready to send the next byte. So I've set up a function, block until ready. I've done this before, so that's why I've got my, my, um, I really should do that before everything, shouldn't I? Block until ready. Block until ready. Block until ready. And my block until ready function is going to do this. It will um, get its memory all sorted out. Letter R zero equals Andra UART, and it will load the no offsets. What I want offset UART um, TXD ready. Okay. 
Okay, and then I'm going to litter whatever was in that. That register. So let's have a look at that one. TXD ready. Okay, TXD ready. Whoops. Let's give it this page. Come on. Events, TXD ready. That means data sent from TXD, which actually generates an event. You could respond to this with an interrupt if you like, but I'm just gonna poll <laughs> because it's simple for today. So if TXD ready has a one, that means the event has been generated. And if it's got a zero, it means an event is not generated. So I can check if this is zero or not. If it's one, that means it's ready for the next byte to be put in. So I'll put in here, um, exit block. Uh, or return from block until ready. So we can say compare and branch if not zero. Someone's saying if there's another microbit receiving data, you'd have to use the RX stuff. And the RXD has, I think it's got eight bytes in a cache. So you can, um, you don't have to read them all at once. You can wait a little minute for all eight to be ready and then read them as a, as a group. So if it's not zero, that means I want to return. Else I want to just do, do the same thing again. Block until ready. And if I do find that it's not zero and I am returning, I'm just going to set that to zero <laughs> just to make sure that I'm, I'm got things correct. Store R2, R0, R1. So it's going to reset the TX ready register. Just, just as if you were in that interrupt loop, make sure that, that event is cleared. Well, we should be ready. We should be ready. Uh, I'm going to send the same. I'll start by just sending one note and then we can see if our program's going to work. Yikes, I hope it works. I'll just get block up to here and then play. That's not, doesn't sound right. <laughs> uh oh. Wonder what's going on. Oh, it's getting something. I don't think it's working right. It's trying to send them too quickly or something. Hmm. That's not right. What have I done wrong? Oh, I need to have a delay. It was trying to send them really, really quickly over and over again. Okay, I'll set a delay here uh, of three, same as what we were doing last time, three million um, delay, a three million delay. So the BL delay has a, is a bit difficult to work out exactly how many cycles that is. There we go. So there's my, my notes coming on the wire. The three same three bytes I was sending last time. The question was, is it unable to distinguish between notes if I send them too fast? It yeah, it it knows that the difference. It just keeps triggering a new note. And that they it never gets to finish the old note, if you know what I mean. It, it resets all of the synthesizer stuff to start a new note every single time. And the synthesizer doesn't like doing that. Or it, it, can, it can like it, it might sound cool, but in that case it didn't sound cool. Um, I might do my, change it so I'm actually changing my notes again.
And there we go. So this is MIDI version two. I'll change it so we get a slightly, something is slightly wilder in our loop. I'll add three each time. Ooh, it's a diminished chord. Oh no, what's going to happen? Do, 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 do. I'll do four and see if that will be something interesting as well. That might be cool. This is a cool arpeggiator I'm making really with my micro bit now. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. This is, this is funky. Um, folks, thank you for joining me on this little wild network week. I have to say, this is my favorite week of the course because I get to do this fun demo. <laughs> and it's really been, um, been a lot of fun today. So I'm going to stop the stream right there. I think I've only had one comment of the day. So if you're joining me next week, throw a few more comments in the chat. Um, I'll see you folks next time, next week. See ya. <laughs>